The Rise and Fall of Babylon, Nimrod, Nebuchadnezzar, the Antichrist, and a New World Order. Today we see a lot of people challenge God. However, this seed had been planted for thousands of years. This is the story of the great cities that challenged God. It starts with the first man who created such a kingdom. The story of Nimrod and Babel is an intriguing tale that speaks to themes of ambition, pride, and the desire for unity in a way that defies the will of God. Nimrod's accounts are primarily found in the book of Genesis, specifically in chapters 10 and 11. Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalneh in the land of Shinar in Babylonia. The name Nimrod has become synonymous with being a rebel influenced by his rebellious act against God through the building of the Tower of Babel. Nimrod is primarily known as a mighty hunter before the Lord, making him an unparalleled figure in terms of his skills and might, according to Genesis 10.9. His hunting skills weren't just a sport, it was a sign of leadership and strength in a world that was still recovering from the Great Flood. Nimrod was a protector, a provider, and a conqueror. He was a powerful leader credited with building the city of Babylon, among others. People often connect Nimrod with the idea of civilization itself, bringing people together to live in cities rather than scattered about. The Bible tells us that his kingdom began with Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalneh, in the land of Shinar, Genesis 10.10. 10. These locations later became the ancient kingdom of Babylon, which plays a significant role throughout biblical history. The cities Nimrod founded continued to become great empires. The ancient city of Akkad was a major center of early civilization. Kalneh is another city in the region of Shinar, though it's less known compared to the others. After Nimrod was done setting up those first cities in Shinar, he moved to another place called Assyria and built even more cities. He built Nineveh, perhaps the most famous Assyrian city, especially known for the story of Jonah and the whale. He also built Rezin. The Bible says this is a great city and it's located between Nineveh and Kala. So Nimrod wasn't just strong and brave, he was also a city builder. He established centers that would later become key locations in ancient history and in other Bible stories. To build a city requires great ambition. Nimrod had fulfilled his ambition on the earth and now set his sights on God. Babel Babel is often thought to be the same as Babylon. In fact, some Bible translations actually list the city as Babel rather than Babylon. His kingdom began with Babylon and Erech and Akkad and Kalneh in the land of Shinar. Before Nimrod and his kingdom, the people were likely organized in smaller communities and tribes. The Bible doesn't specifically mention the governance or social structures that existed before Nimrod, but we can assume they were more basic and less centralized. Within the context of Babylon is the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, 1 through 9, which is perhaps the most famous episode involving Babylon. In the middle of Mesopotamia, there was a big flat area of land that was good for farming and looked welcoming. The people of this era, filled with purpose and ambition, agreed to construct a city. But this was no ordinary city. Its centerpiece would be a tower, a ziggurat reaching up to the heavens so high they believed that it would make them invincible even to the acts of God. After the flood, people began to settle and grow in number. Before the tower's construction, the people spoke one language and had a united purpose. The people who settled in Shinar are the ones who attempted to build the Tower of Babel, as told in Genesis 11, 1 through 9. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves, otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth." Genesis chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. God wasn't too happy about this and confused their languages, scattering them over the earth. Their intent was to achieve unity, but not under God's terms. They wanted to build a tower to reach heaven, which was a direct defiance of God's plan for them to multiply and spread across the earth. 
The tower served as a guide to them. It was a symbol of what people could achieve and how smart they were. As bricks were fired and as the mortar was spread, the tower began its climb towards the heavens. It was to be named Babel. Nimrod, as a powerful leader and builder of Babylon, embodies the themes of ambition and pride that are evident in the story of the Tower of Babel. So the tower was left incomplete, a leftover from when people thought they could reach the sky but were reminded they couldn't escape their human limits. But this is not the end of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon Babylon is the capital of the empire, which would eventually destroy Judah. It is in southern Mesopotamia. In the Bible, the city of Babylon is contrasted with the city of Jerusalem, the proud city of humanity versus the holy city of God. The term Babel originates from the Hebrew language and means gate of God. However, because the word Babel is so similar to the word Balal, confusion, that it's associated with the famous Tower of Babel and the confusion of human languages. Babel, Babylon, is a symbol of rebellion against God, the earthly city of human splendor opposing the heavenly city that glorifies God. Ancient Babylon was a famous city that was situated in the region of Mesopotamia that is now known as Iraq. It is used throughout the Bible as a metaphor for human arrogance, disobedience, and the worship of false gods. The Bible doesn't give us a ton of details about what Babylon was like before the reign of Nimrod, but it does provide some interesting points for consideration. Babylon was part of the land of Shinar, which is where people settled after Noah's Ark came to rest and the waters of the flood receded. Babylon in the Bible was a place where many people, including the Israelites, were taken and made to live far from home. When Babylon defeated a city called Jerusalem, they didn't just take the land. They also took away many smart and skilled people from Judah. These people had to work for the king and help make Babylon a better place. They were more than just laborers who made use of their hands. Many of them held essential jobs such as teaching, being artists, and holding other positions. They were a key part of Babylon's rise to prominence and success. The defeat and exile wasn't a surprise. Israel had been warned by prophets such as Isaiah and Jeremiah that they would be subject to a significant onslaught if they turned their backs on God. Nebuchadnezzar at this time was the king of Babylon. One day his army went to Judah and conquered it. Nebuchadnezzar had married a beautiful princess from the Persian mountains where Tehran, Iran's capital, is now located. She arrived at Nebuchadnezzar's palace but quickly became homesick. She missed the mountains, the trees, and the wild animals the most. When Nebuchadnezzar learned the reason for her dissatisfaction, he immediately made a commitment to rectify the situation. He built a huge mountain out of bricks and then covered it with bushes, trees, and plants of various kinds. Because of its incredible beauty, it was recognized as one of the seven wonders of the world. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon drew a large number of visitors. Then, on top of the gardens, he built a private zoo of wild animals to please his wife unfamiliar with the flat plains surrounding Babylon. One day he was on the roof of his magnificent palace when he realized what he had accomplished. Isn't this the great Babylon that I have built by my power and glory, he asked. He dozed off and dreamed of a massive tree reaching for the sky. Animals sought refuge beneath it and birds perched in its branches. The tree was cut down and bound in iron before regrowing. He asked Daniel for an interpretation once more. The king shared the news with his magicians, mediums, Chaldeans, and diviners, but none of them were able to make sense of what it meant. Daniel was sent to solve the problem after all other attempts had been unsuccessful. It's strange that Nebuchadnezzar questioned his wise man rather than going directly to Daniel to get his interpretation of the dream, given Daniel's history of interpreting dreams. However, it appears that Nebuchadnezzar was a slow learner. Daniel was given the name Belshazzar by Nebuchadnezzar after his Babylonian god Bel. The man was clinging to his pagan idols. Daniel chapter 4 verses 14 through 24. He shouted aloud and said this, Cut down the tree and cut off its branches. Shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the living creatures run from under it, and the birds fly from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump with its roots in the ground, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the new grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him feed with the animals in the grass of the earth. 
Let his mind and nature be changed from a man's, and let an animal's mind and nature be given to him, and let seven periods of time pass over him. This sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones, so that the living may know without doubt that the Most High God rules over the kingdom of mankind, and He bestows it on whomever He desires, and sets over it the humblest and lowliest of men. This is the dream which I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belshazzar, explain its meaning, since none of the wise men of my kingdom are able to reveal its interpretation to me. But you are able, for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, whose Babylonian name was Belshazzar, was appalled and speechless for a while because he was deeply concerned about the destiny of the king, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation frighten you. Belshazzar answered, My lord, may the dream be meant for those who hate you and its message for your enemies. The tree that you saw, which became great and grew strong, whose height reached to heaven and which was visible to all the earth, whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and on which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field lived and in whose branches the birds of the sky nested, it is you, O king, who have become great and grown strong. Your greatness has increased, and it reaches to heaven, and your dominion reaches to the ends of the earth. In that the king saw an angelic watcher, a holy one descending from heaven, and saying, Cut the tree down and destroy it, but leave the stump with its roots in the earth, but with a band of iron and bronze around it, in the new grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven and let him feed with the beasts of the field until seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is the decree of the Most High, God, which has come upon my lord the king. Daniel appeared to be taken aback for a time when he heard the interpretation of the dream, which suggests that God had apparently revealed the meaning of the dream to Daniel as soon as Nebuchadnezzar finished recounting it. He didn't wish the king ill, but rather hoped the king would turn from his sins and God's awful judgment. Daniel delivered the good news first, then the bad. Nebuchadnezzar would not only be the tree, but also the stump. The final words that Daniel spoke to Nebuchadnezzar during his visit were an earnest appeal for the king to repent and throw himself on the compassion of God. However, there was no response from the king at all. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the upper level of the royal palace of Babylon. The king said thoughtfully, Is not this the great Babylon which I myself have built as the royal residence and seat of government by the might of my power and for the honor and glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came as if falling from heaven, saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared. The kingdom has been removed from you, and you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the animals of the field. You will be given grass to eat like the cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you know without any doubt that the Most High God rules over the kingdom of mankind, and He bestows it on whomever He desires. Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. Daniel chapter 4 verses 28 through 33. With time, Nebuchadnezzar appears to have forgotten God's warning of impending judgment on his arrogance. God's 12-month extension of grace did not move the king to repentance. If anything, the delay made him believe he had escaped with his life. One day he looked out from his palace and exclaimed, isn't this Babylon the great that I have built by my vast power and for my majestic glory? In other words, his ego had reached its highest point, and he was profoundly reflecting on the splendor of the kingdom he had built. But at that very moment, the judgment Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream was proclaimed by a voice from heaven. He was immediately struck with a form of insanity, causing him to act and live like an animal. After his lengthy exile was over, Nebuchadnezzar made a proclamation that was a radical departure from his earlier ones. He praised the Most High, declaring that his dominion is an everlasting dominion. He does whatever he wants. No one can stop him. Through his humiliation, the Babylonian king discovered who was truly in charge. He regained control of his kingdom after regaining his sanity. 
Nebuchadnezzar's final recorded words in the Bible are, God is able to humble those who walk in pride, a truth we must all embrace and live by. Don't force God to teach you like he did Nebuchadnezzar. Remember that pride always precedes a fall. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. There is only one king who rules over the entire universe. God is a judge of kings and nations. God judged the unrighteousness of Nebuchadnezzar's government because he sought to usurp God's sole authority. And in the end, Nebuchadnezzar wound up making the very confession God decreed he would make. Heaven rules. The Fall of Babylon Belshazzar succeeded Nebuchadnezzar as king many years later. One night during a big party, Belshazzar and his high-ranking friends were disrespectfully using special cups and plates they had stolen from a holy temple in Jerusalem. At some point during the festivities, a phantom hand appeared and scribbled on the palace wall. If you received an ominous message from God, what would you do? There is absolutely no way to escape, and no man can save you. This king was about to hear the worst news of his life, and it will be known for years to come. The events of Daniel chapter 5 occurred in 539 BC, the year, the very night in fact, that the great Babylonian kingdom founded by Nebuchadnezzar fell to a coalition of the Medes and the Persians. If Belshazzar was aware of Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation due to his pride at the hands of God in Daniel 4, he had clearly not learned from it. Rather, he treated God's holy vessels like bar mugs, demonstrating his contempt for them. According to God, this action marked the beginning of the end for the king's empire. When the Lord started writing about Belshazzar's destruction on the palace wall, the king lost control of his bodily functions out of terror. But like Nebuchadnezzar before him, the king promised a reward to anyone who could decipher the inscription. His so-called wise men, on the other hand, were a bunch of knuckleheads. The queen had emerged from her chamber by this time to reassure the king. Daniel was called in and generously honored since she remembered his prior service to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 5, verses 17-21 through 21. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the writing to the king and reveal the interpretation to him. O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all the peoples, nations, and speakers of every language trembled and feared him. Whomever he wished, he killed, and whomever he wished, he kept alive, whomever he wished, he promoted, and whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken from him. He was also driven from mankind and his mind was made like that of an animal, and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he came to know without doubt that the Most High God rules over the kingdom of mankind and he appoints it to whomever he wills. Daniel was well aware that Belshazzar was a wicked king whom God had sent to be judged, and he had no desire to share in his spoils. Nonetheless, Daniel had a message of judgment to deliver which was preceded by a refresher course on Nebuchadnezzar's life. According to Daniel, the problem was that Belshazzar knew all this, yet he still refused to repent and be humble. Belshazzar exalted himself against the Lord and worshipped inanimate objects rather than the God who gave him existence and breath. So rather than repenting of the very things that had gotten his predecessor into trouble, he simply shook his fist in the face of God. Daniel chapter 5, verses 25 through 31. This is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Aparson, numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. This is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales of righteousness and found deficient. Paris, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple, and a chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation concerning him was issued, declaring that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. During that same night, Belshazzar, the last Chaldean king, was slain by troops of the invading army. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom. He was about the age of 62. 
Daniel interpreted the writing on the wall after reviewing the king's crimes against God. The words meant that Belshazzar's reign had ended, that he was lacking in God's eyes, and that his kingdom had been given. This story is so well known that the phrase, he can see the writing on the wall, has become a proverb, implying that a person can see what's going to happen in the future and understands his fate. Well, it was too late for Belshazzar to change his mind. God declares war on Babylon and announces victory over Babylon. Jeremiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 10, Amplified Bible. In those days and at that time, says the Lord, the children of Israel will come, they and the children of Judah together. They will come up weeping in repentance as they come and seek the Lord their God, inquiring for and of him. They will ask the way to Zion with their faces in that direction, saying, Come, let us join ourselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will not be forgotten. My people have become lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have made their turn aside to the seductive places of idolatry on the mountains. They have gone along from one sin to another, from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their own resting place. All who found them have devoured them and their adversaries have said, We are not guilty. Because they have sinned against the Lord and are no longer holy to Him, their true habitation of righteousness and justice, even the Lord, the confident hope of their fathers. Wander away from the midst of Babylon and go out of the land of the Chaldeans. Be like the male goats who serve as leaders at the head of the flocks. For behold, I will stir up and bring up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country. They will equip themselves and set up the battle lines against her. From there she will be taken captive. Their arrows will be like an expert warrior who will not return empty-handed. Chaldea will become plunder. All who plunder her will be satisfied, says the Lord. In the eyes of God, the people of Israel were like sheep without a shepherd, mistreated by both their leaders and captors. Behold, the least of the nations shall be a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. Because of the wrath of the Lord, she shall not be inhabited, but she shall be wholly desolate. Everyone who goes by Babylon shall be horrified and hiss at all her plagues. Here we learn why God was destroying this great empire. To begin with, the Babylonians were glad they could devastate and subjugate Judah. Yes, Babylon was God's tool to chasten his sinful people, but the Babylonians went too far and enjoyed it too much. They acted like a joyful calf, playing in the grain and eating its fill. God will ultimately curse any nation that has cursed Israel. Jeremiah chapter 50, verses 14 through 16. Set yourselves in battle formation against Babylon on every side, all you archers. Shoot at her, do not spare the arrows, for she has sinned against the Lord. Raise the battle cry against her on every side. She has given her hand in agreement and has surrendered. Her pillars have fallen, her walls have been torn down, for this is the vengeance of the Lord. Take vengeance on her, as she has done to others, do to her. Cut off the sower from Babylon, and the one who handles the sickle at the time of harvest. For fear of the sword of the oppressor, everyone will return to his people, and everyone will flee to his own land. Just as Babylon had been God's tool to chasten Judah, so the invaders, Cyrus with the Medes and Persians, and later Alexander with his Greek army, would be God's weapon to defeat Babylon. God spoke to the invading armies and commanded them to get their weapons ready and shout for victory because they would win the battle. This was no ordinary war. This was the vengeance of the Lord. I set a trap for you, and you also were caught, O Babylon, and you did not know it. You have been found and also seized because you have struggled against the Lord. The Lord has opened his armory and has brought out the nations who unknowingly are the weapons of his indignation. For it is a work of the Lord God of hosts in the land of the Chaldeans. Come against her from the farthest border, open her storehouses, pile it up like heaps of rubbish, burn and destroy her completely. Let nothing be left of her. Kill all her young bulls, her strength, her young men. Let them go down to the slaughter. Woe, judgment is coming to the Chaldeans, for the day has come, the time of their punishment. The Lord was in command of the invasion, and his orders were to be carried out explicitly. Babylon the hammer was itself shattered.
Babylon was caught in God's trap and couldn't escape God's weapons. Their young men would be executed like cattle, for the day of judgment for Babylon had come. The Lord directed the Babylonians' attention to the great army that he had called from the north, a cruel army without mercy whose march sounded like the roaring of the sea. This report paralyzed the king of Babylon. Like a hungry lion looking for prey, Cyrus and then Alexander would attack Babylon and nobody would be able to resist. Flee out of Babylon, let every one of you save his life. Do not be destroyed in her punishment, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He is going to pay her what she has earned. Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand, intoxicating all the earth. The nations drank her wine, therefore the nations have gone mad. Babylon has suddenly fallen and it is shattered. Wail for her if you care to. Get balm for her incurable pain, Perhaps she may be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she was not to be healed. Abandon her and let each captive return to his own country, for her guilt and judgment have reached to heaven and are lifted up to the very skies. The Lord has brought about our vindication and has revealed the righteousness of our cause. Come and let us proclaim in Zion the work of the Lord our God. The Lord reassured his people that he was still with them and gave them another order to leave Babylon as soon as they could. When Cyrus opened the door for the people to go home, about 50,000 people returned to Judah to restore Jerusalem and the temple. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years of exile have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and keep my good promise to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans and thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for peace and well-being and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope then you will call on me, and you will come and pray to me, and I will hear your voice, and I will listen to you. Then with a deep longing you will seek me and require me as a vital necessity, and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes, and I will free you and gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. With you I shatter the farmer and his yoke of oxen, and with you I shatter governors and commanders." Babylon was built in a rather flat area, but to the eyes of the world it loomed like a great mountain of destruction on the horizon of history. But after God was done with Babylon, it would be nothing more than a dormant volcano, a burnt mountain. Nobody would even excavate the ruins to find the stones to build with the city would be deserted and desolate forever. The people reminded God of the wrongs committed by Nebuchadnezzar. He had grabbed Judah like a piece of food, gnawed on them, eaten them whole, and absorbed all the good fortune God had bestowed upon them. The Final Babylon Revelation chapter 17 and 18 concerns the very end. The remainder of Revelation is dominated by two female figures, one a filthy prostitute and the other a pure bride. Neither is a person, both are personifications. They represent cities. The title, A Tale of Two Cities, could be used. Babylon and Jerusalem, the city of man and the city of God are their names. We'll look at the former. Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, Amplified Bible. Then another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her immorality, corrupting them with idolatry. Revelation chapter 16, verse 19, Amplified Bible. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and God kept in mind Babylon the great, to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce and furious wrath. The Bible frequently portrays cities in a negative light. The initial reference, which is usually crucial, links them to Lamech's line of weaponry and the production of mass destructive weapons. They concentrate people and hence sinners, and thus sin. Greed and pride are the two sins that are highlighted in this passage. Both are linked to money's idolatry, because it's impossible to worship both God and Mammon at the same time. When Nebuchadnezzar, a brutal tyrant who slaughtered kids, animals, and even trees when conquering new territory, this city became the seat of a great and strong kingdom. In the meantime, Israel's King David had built Jerusalem as his capital. It was not in a strategic location for trade because it was not near the sea, a large river, or a significant road. 
It was, nevertheless, the city of God, the site where he chose to live among his people, at first in the tent Moses assembled, later in the temple Solomon built. As predicted, that horrible city deteriorated into a dismal heap of debris, completely deserted, except by desert wild animals. The fact that the books of Daniel and Revelation have so many parallels is no coincidence. Both books contain end-of-the-world visions that are very similar. However, Daniel received the revelations during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. He had been a young man in the first of three deportations. He had seen the future trajectory of world empires up to and beyond the time of Christ, to the very end of history, the reign of Antichrist, the millennial rule, the resurrection of the dead, and the day of judgment. The city of Babylon, described in the book of Revelation, will serve as a commercial hub where people can buy and sell goods. This is evident in the mention of how traders are affected by its destruction. Revelation chapter 18, verses 11 through 16, Amplified Bible. And merchants of the earth will weep and grieve over her because no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet, all kinds of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article of very costly and lavish wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spices and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat of cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots and carriages and of slaves and human lives. The ripe fruits and delicacies of your soul's desire have gone from you, and all things that were luxurious and extravagant are lost to you, never again to be found. The merchants who handled these articles, who grew wealthy from their business with her, will stand a long way off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud, saying, Woe, woe for the great city that was robed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, gilded and adorned with gold, with precious stones, and with pearls. But it will be corrupt and corrupting with materialism replacing morality, pleasure replacing purity, wealth replacing wisdom, and lust replacing love. The simile of the harlot is especially appropriate giving anyone what they want in exchange for money. Revelation chapter 19 verse 14 Amplified Bible they will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will triumph and conquer them, because He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him and on His side are the called and chosen and faithful. But Babylon is doomed. She and they will fall. Their days will be numbered. The incredible manner in which this is accomplished is absolutely plausible in today's environment. Ambitious politicians hungry for power resent this financial clout. They are even prepared to bring about economic disaster if that will enable them to take over. The kings will be jealous of the woman who rides them and will resolve to destroy her. The city will be engulfed in flames. It will be the world's worst economic disaster in history. Many, many people will weep and mourn over the ruins. The disaster will have been brought about by God, not by any physical action. He will have instilled in their hearts the desire to fulfill His mission. He'll have persuaded them to join forces with the beast to fight the city. The Antichrist will have political authority and the false prophet religious control. The kings will now offer them economic control in return for delegated powers for themselves. But their possession of such privileges will be extremely short. Revelation chapter 17 verse 12. The ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom but together they receive authority as kings for a single hour for a common purpose, along with the beast. Babylon's demise is so certain that it's depicted in Revelation as having already occurred. This is something Christians can be assured of. However, there are practical reasons for informing them. What is the connection between God's people and this final Babylon? There are three rules to follow. First, there will be many martyrs in the city. The whore is drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. This last phrase again indicates the presence of Christians and occurs throughout Revelation. In a city devoted to immorality, pious people have no place. A conscience is something that the community does not desire. Second, Christians are instructed to come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven 
and God has remembered her crimes. Revelation chapter 18, verses 4 and 5, Amplified Bible. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not be a partner in her sins and receive her plagues. For her sins, her crimes, her transgressions have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her wickedness and crimes for judgment. This is nearly identical to Jeremiah's appeal to the exiles. Third, when Babylon falls, there is to be a celebration. Revelation chapter 18, verse 20, Amplified Bible. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints, God's people and apostles and prophets who were martyred, because God has executed vengeance for you through righteous judgment upon her. This is done in Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 5, Amplified Bible. After these things, I heard something like the great and mighty shout of a vast multitude in heaven, exclaiming, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God because His judgments are true and righteous. He has judged, convicted, and pronounced sentence on the great prostitute who was corrupting and ruining and poisoning the earth with her adultery. And He has imposed the penalty for the blood of His bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke shall ascend forever and ever. Then the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures also fell down and worshipped God, who sits on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Then from the throne there came a voice, saying, Praise our God, all you bondservants of His, you who fear Him, the small and the great. On that day only God's people will be singing Hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. All of this culminates in the Babylon of Revelation chapter 17 verse 1 through chapter 19 verse 10, Babylon the Great, that symbolizes the anti-God system that controls the world in the end times and then is destroyed by the Lord. Why Babylons Matter to Us Nimrod and Babylon's story teaches us that being too proud can get us into trouble. It's important to be humble. It teaches us that however mighty or ambitious we may be, our plans must align with God's will. When they don't, the results can be undesirable. The story of Babylon and Nimrod is that of caution. It warns us against the dangers of pride and self-reliance, urging us to depend on God instead. It also speaks to the folly of human efforts to achieve unity or immortality outside of God's plan. Whether as a community or as individuals, the story reminds us that our ambitions should be aligned with God's will Otherwise, like the people of Babylon, we risk finding ourselves working against God's purposes, and that can only lead to confusion and ultimately to our downfall. So the next time you find yourself striving to build a tower, take a moment to consider whether your ambitions align with God's plan for you. Remember, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Psalms 127.1 Prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah foretold Babylon's fall due to its injustices, idolatry, and immorality. Therefore, as individuals or as a society, our actions have consequences. Oppressing others, disregarding morality, and turning away from what's right can lead to downfall. We also see that earthly kingdoms are temporary. Despite its might and grandeur, Babylon eventually fell to the Medo-Persian Empire, just as it was foretold. In other words, everything on earth is temporary, from our own successes to the way society is built. The only thing that will last forever is God's kingdom. So focus on what will last forever, not just on what is here today and gone tomorrow. The story of Babylon getting powerful and then falling apart shows us that God tries to communicate with us in many ways, and we should pay attention and not be too proud. Babylon was an amazing place made by people but it fell apart because God wanted it to. This story is always important because it reminds us that real power and greatness belong to God. Like it says in the Bible, God's rule is forever, and it will always be there for all generations. Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today reminded of the story of Nimrod, a man of might, power, and ambition. We see in his tale a warning, a lesson about the trappings of human pride and the folly of trying to build our own kingdoms instead of seeking yours. Lord, we ask for the wisdom to recognize when our pursuits are led by self-interest rather than by your guiding hand. 
Help us to understand that true strength comes from being rooted in you and that every tower we build without your blessing is destined to crumble. May we be builders not of towers that reach vainly towards the sky, but of lives that are grounded in your love and grace. Teach us to seek your kingdom first, understanding that all other things will be added unto us. Guard our hearts against the pride that leads to confusion and separation, and instead instill in us a spirit of humility and unity. Let us be hunters of souls for your kingdom, chasing after what is good, what is noble, and what brings you glory. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.